Tere. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm the last speaker today. Um, it's an honor, I think. Uh, I'll try not to bore you too much. Um, you see the picture. It's quite illustrative. Um, what have we become? We were bacteria, we became fish, we came out of the water, and at the end, we're bringing back to the earth what it gave us in a different way. That's not the way it should be. So basically what I'm going to explain to you is, is, is a story about waste and how are we going to get rid of it. In a sense, basically the, the zero waste movement to which I belong, in a way, can be seen as a competitor with a let's do it, in a sense that if we make it to zero waste, you don't have any waste to go and collect. So, but I'm sure we'll make it compatible somehow. Um, waste, uh, what is waste? I'm sure you know what waste is, but I thought um, since everything is very interactive here today, I, I thought of like making it more visible. Let, let me try one thing, let's see if it works. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's take waste. So, this is how waste looks like, right? In, a, in the civilized world. Because, of course, in the Middle Ages, they didn't have this. Or in the prehistoric times, they didn't have plastic bags. And it's important, they were black. Oops. It's important that it's black, because like this, you don't see what is inside, right? If you make waste visible, then you might realize that it is not waste. And then maybe someone will have to pick it up and recycle it. So, waste, is it resources? Am I, what, what am I saying? Let, let's try. I'll clean it, don't worry. Um, can a volunteer come? Profession? Come up. Let's see how much waste do we have here. Can, can, can you separate it a bit and tell me what is in here? We use at the environmental when we have cups. Let me add, this is the, 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 the transparent one is PET, PET, fully recyclable. The white one is P, uh, polypropylene. If you mix them, it's very difficult to recycle them. You're, you're, going to get, you're going to downcycle, you're not going to recycle. Important to keep them separate. But these are both resources. Some more? Well, yeah. Well. <laughs> What else? PET bottles, fully recyclable. What else? These are all packaging. It's all mainly made of paper, so it can either be recycled. Well, with a bit of plastic, that's a bit difficult. Otherwise, it can be composted without uh, any problem if the ink is OK. This plastic film is something that should be avoided, but it can be with difficulties recycled, but it can be avoided. And organic waste. I think that's mainly it, right? That's what we have. The organics can be composted, can be, you can make biogas with it, you can do lots of things. But generally speaking, I don't see much waste here. What I see is the waste that we have created, because this waste was not waste before. So if this is going to be waste, it's because we're going to leave it in this black bag. If we separate it, it's not waste. So that's basically a summary. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'll turn it later, don't worry. Well, if you want to do it when I'm talking, but I mean, it's better. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. So, as you can see, um, it's up to us. And, and we care. So, that's basically what we had. That's what is inside. I mean, every, I've been to many places in the world, so that the waste distribution is different. This is a bit for a European average. So mainly, the biggest part of our waste stream that we have at home is organics. If you, it's true that if you go to India, you go to like uh, uh, the global south, the organic part can go up to 80 or 90%, which means that if you separate it right, there's no waste there. What you have actually is a potential compost, is a soil improver. It can bring the soil, it can bring the, the health that your soils need because we have deforestation, and we need this, the carbon to go back to the soils, not to go to the atmosphere, because then it creates climate change. If you put it back in the soils, 
you, have, uh, you, you don't have waste. Then you have paper, you have packaging, you have glass, and then you have these others that we didn't find much here, but it's, it, they are fully avoidable. But these others is what we, generally speaking, should be throwing away. It's 20 to 25 percent in the civilized world. What we actually do is throw a lot more away. It's more than 50 or to 80 percent. But did I say away? What does away mean? Um, Thomas said that uh, he hasn't been there. I haven't been there. Um, oh, actually, I've been there. One of these is these away places. Landfills, they go there. Um, if you put all these organics into the landfills instead of the carbon going back to the soils, what it does is create methane, which is a lot more powerful than CO2 to create climate change. Plus, the, the plastic and everything mixed with it is very difficult to recycle. Problem. Wrong. It has some advantages if you capture the, the, the methane from it, but it's not very efficient, and then it has some disadvantages. I don't want to go too much into that, because I want to talk to you about zero waste, not about what we're we doing wrong. But it's clear that in the future we cannot continue burning resources. Another place where it goes, and it shouldn't go, is incinerators as well. I mean, what sense does it make to burn plastic? Plastic is true, it's made of oil, after all, but, but making one of these glasses new, it takes five to 25 more energy than to recycle this one. So we should be recycling them. Especially because, as you see in the first picture I showed you, I mean, imagine in 200 years' time, there's not going to be oil in this planet, probably. But this plastic cap that I used during 10 seconds here is going to be there. And what are, if there's people in the world still, going to think about me, that smart guy of like uh, the most affluent generation in humankind, the most intelligent, the most civilized, who was using these plastic cups for basically 10 minutes. Doesn't make any sense. <coughs> well, no, doesn't make any sense. So, <coughs> incinerators basically, they turn again the carbon, put it in the atmosphere instead of putting it back into the ground, and it, they also have some advantages, they have some problems. But of course, this is not a tool of the future. Incinerators have been, were invented in the 19th century, and uh, they have been developed in the 20th century. They are less harmful, but they still destroy resources, they still emit CO2, and there are better ways. So, this is where you find ourselves. I mean, wh what we see here, this is household waste. Household waste is at the end of the phase. The energy and the waste associated to this comes in the extraction and in the production phase. So in a linear society, what you have is you have energy and waste and air pollution for the extraction of virgin materials that you're going to use to produ pro produce items. You need more energy, you produce more waste, more pollution, more water pollution, more carbon dioxide. Then you go and consume them. And when you consume, you have discarded materials that, again, uh, are more waste. All of this contributes to climate change. So, what does recycling do? Recycling, what it does, very useful, it saves the extracting part. So you save some emissions and some waste in the first part, which is, it is very important. The reuse of objects, it saves these two parts. Between 50 and 80% of the energy of the waste, like, embodied in the waste, it comes from this part. So if you reuse an object, what you're doing is avoiding most of the emissions, even if you don't see it. But the emissions, and also, I'm, not, I'm talking about emissions and, and materials, but there's lots of environmental justice issues associated to, to this. It's imports coming from certain countries with certain regimes that there's some interest in, 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 in supporting from some countries. So a good way to fight global warming is recycling, as you know. And, and it is very useful. So why waste? Very short story, because it looks like waste has always been with us. But as we have seen, the Middle Ages, they didn't have these fantastic black bags. So why waste? Um, as you know, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the labor productivity, how many people do you need to produce one unit, has increased, well, has decreased a lot. We are a lot more productive. We would one person, you can do now what you would have needed 10,000 people to do before. So what happens? This is fantastic. But what happens is that we have so many things that we don't know what to do with them. So we need less people. 
a lot less unemployment. So the crisis that we have now is not new. Back in the crisis of the, uh, 1929 in the US, they found that overproduction, too many things, unemployment. There was a guy who came up with the idea, say like, plant obsolescence. Let's build things so that they break, so that we can produce them again, sell them again, and like this, if things last, should last a lot less, we can sell a lot more, we can only generate more employment, and we're going to get out of the crisis. Fantastic idea. It was not very well perceived at that moment. Then it came the Second World War, and the US, with all the war, basically managed to employ lots of people in the manufacturing industry of weapons. And after the war, they had to do something with the people. So what did they do? Well, they embraced one of these principles. This is what we popularly know as the American way of life. Take something like, should not last too long because I'm going to change it next year, because it's going to break. Um, Brooks Stevens, 1954, said, plant obsolescence is instilling in the buyer the desire to own something a little newer, a little better, a little sooner than is necessary. Pla so, plant obsolescence was also complained with perceived obsolescence. Some things might take too long to break. So what you do? You change the fashion. So something looks old-fashioned, so I should uh, well, throw it away. Why do we change the fashion every year or every six months? Good question. These things are still working, and we have to change them just because they look old, and we don't want to look old-fashioned because we want to be different. But we are the same as everybody else in the end, <laughs> just changing everything every six months. Very quickly. So from the sustainability point of view, this is a problem, of course. This, this doesn't stand. This doesn't stand because we're using a lot more resources than we uh, have in this planet. There is the planet, in a way, is like if you have a company. You have a capital in the company. If you are using your capital and spending more than what you have year after year, what you have is that you're increasing a deficit. In 2010, we used 150% of the resources that the Earth produced. And this has been going on for, for more than 30 years now. So we're running a deficit. And the financial crisis shows very well what happens when you run a deficit. Then you have a debt. And when you have debt, then what do you do? The difference is that we don't have a, a, like a World Bank or a, like a Galaxy Bank that is going to borrow us ecological capital for the next generations. And this is a very serious issue. Europe, for example, most of the issues that we use in Europe are being imported. If the rest of the world is going to get to the level of consumption of Europe, basically what we're going to have is uh, we'll have to buy another planet or two. So very quickly, as important as building a circular economy is to reduce the materials use. And then I jump into my topic very quickly, that is zero waste as part of building the sustainability, as part of like how to build an economy that is sustainable. And sustainable is not only recycling, because even if we would manage to recycle 100%, all of this, even if we would recycle all of this, we will still not be sustainable. Because recycling is not a closed loop. There's, a, there's uh, the second law of thermodynamics. There's energy, um, we're losing energy in every transformation. So, like it or not, this plastic cup should be a reusable uh, glass made of uh, glass that could, should be um, fully recyclable. So, zero waste, from recycling to zero waste, because recycling is not enough, because we have to get to zero waste. What is zero waste? How do we get there? Zero waste, basically, it is a movement, it is a thinking. I mean, you would say, like, zero waste is impossible. Yes, imagine that I have an airline company, and I tell you, we guarantee you 10% accidents. Are you okay with that? Or how much, how much accidents do you want? 20%, 30%? Say, no, your aim is zero. I mean, any car company or anyone who's trying to sell you a product, they say, like, well, it, it, can, it can fly 95% of the times. Are you happy with that? I would not fly with that. So it's the same with waste. It is very difficult right now because the whole system is built around the concept of waste because things have to be made in a way that cannot be recycled or reused because otherwise we would break this fantastic cycle that we have built since uh, now 60 or 70 years. So what happened with this is um, this zero waste movement has been going on around the world among communities because, and, and, and here, um, uh, Reiner has said something very important. Countries don't recycle, it's communities who recycle. That's why zero waste works with communities. It's from the lower level that starts the will to change the system. And the systems that I've seen that work the best in 
in the whole world is because people one day have said, I don't want to continue working in, uh, with this uh, incinerator or with this landfill, I want an alternative. And they build alternatives. And these are the zero waste alternatives. So basically, I'm going to tell you the 10 steps to get to zero waste very quickly. First of all, source separation. The highest technology you can imagine for recycling, this. And I think you all have them, at least one or two. So if you do the work at home, most of the work is done. And you don't need machines because you cannot, I mean, if, if, in, if in India you cannot afford to pay one euro for collection, I mean, what, how are you going to build a machine to separate waste at home? That you can do in some places, but in some other places, it's not that difficult. I mean, we produce waste separately. I don't produce a glass with organics with everything mixed up, right? So you separate in the beginning, most of the work is done. Then, door-to-door -door collection. That's something that we're using uh, in Europe in many places. It's been more successful than using containers because it gives a lot more results. But it's also happening in India, for example, in some communities that we have started collecting the waste at the doorstep. This is an example of Catalonia, for example. Uh, the two, Tiana and Tona, in green and blue, they jump from 20% separate collection to more than 80% in a few months. So this is possible, just changing the system with which you collect the waste. So this is possible. More, composting. Separate collection of organics is at the core of zero waste. Because, as we said, most of the waste is organics. Get, separate that and the rest is easy. The rest is easy because if that's contaminated, it costs more money to, to, to clean it and, and it's contaminated and then recycling it is a lot more difficult. You get a lot less quality in the recycling. Then, of course, you can have, and that's the optimum, uh, home composting at home. So most of the waste doesn't leave your place because you can compost it at home. I lived in Brussels. I was having worms in my apartment. My girlfriend hated it. You don't have to use it. I mean, there's some separate collection systems that are better. Um, but you can have, if you have a garden, you can have home composting. Um, you can, uh, there's also, where I live now in Barcelona, we have um, aerobic digesters that do the work for you. You just have to separately collect it. And I tell you, if you separate the organics, the rest of the waste, you can keep it at home for days and weeks because it doesn't smell. As easy as that. The reason why you're taking the waste every day out is because it smells. If you take out the organics, the rest doesn't smell, except from the nappies and this kind of stuff. But recycling. You know what recycling is. I don't go more into that. Reuse, repair, and community centers. This is very useful and very important because, as I said, is where you save more energy, more than recycling. If there's things that you don't need anymore and they're still useful or can be used, you can give it to a second-hand shop or to a repair center. If it's repaired, you're saving lots of emissions. It can be sold again. You're creating jobs. You are uh, avoiding that this goes to an incinerator or to a landfill, and it can be done, and it's happening. Um, this uh, Kletzlops Park is not far from here, it's in, it's in Sweden. It's a leisure park. I cannot go much into details with that, but you go there to have fun with the children and everything. They teach you how to separate, but in a funny way. Just one anecdote that, that I thought very funny. You go to the bathroom, it's full of paintings, full of used paintings. But many people come out of the bathroom and, and the manager says, this is the only time when people sit down, relax, and think about, ah, and then you see a painting, say, I take it home. They come out of the bathroom with a painting. So, as you can see, they are, they are using their brains to avoid generating waste. And this is very useful. That's the way we want to work. Also because if you go to Los Angeles, from, if you have a characterization, if you see what is in the waste bin in Los Angeles, you see that the reuse part is only 2%, but the value is 40%. That's the value that we are losing when we don't have reuse and repair centers and we send this to the landfill or to the incinerator. So there is opportunity for business. This is an example of a reuse park in, uh, in Berkeley. You see bathrooms, doors, etc. So next to source separation and treatment, we need to reduce the residual fraction because basically now we have seen everything that was recyclable, we have recycled. Everything that's compostable, we have composted. What we have to do now is work on prevention to stop this waste from being there in the first time. How do you stop these plastic cups from being here and, and have uh, an alternative? 
One is waste reduction initiatives and the other one is economic incentives. Examples of waste reduction initiatives. For example, um, the reduced food, waste, uh, food uh, wastage, the last minute market is an initiative started in Italy, now spread around Europe. It basically puts, connects the, the supermarkets with food that is about to expire with, um, uh, how do you call that, uh, with NGOs that are working with people who need uh, food. Um, and so that this food, instead of being uh, thrown into the bin, is being fed, to, you're feeding these people. And instead of being a waste, what you're doing is actually feeding people. Um, plastic bag taxes or bans in Italy, this last year they started with a ban on uh, plastic bags. That means that they're, going to, they're using biodegradable uh, plastic biodegradable bags, which is, is another issue. But in the Philippines, in Ireland, you had taxes. There's lots of examples of how can you do that. This materialization of, of presence, instead of giving, uh, I don't know, uh, a Game Boy or a, or a phone to your niece, you can buy him, I don't know, tickets to the circus, for example. We're buying so many presents that nobody needs. If we think twice, it's been a while since I haven't bought a present that is something physical. But I tell you, I mean, the result is quite good so far. You can be a lot more creative as well with surprises, like bring someone to a landscape or something. It's very useful. Promotion of reusable nappies, for example. That's uh, another idea. Or a workshop to train to self-repair. That's something in Barcelona is also working quite well. I mean, train people to fix your own things. If something is broken, you fix it, you don't have a waste. And you can continue using it. This is a shop in, um, in Italy where basically you can buy almost anything you can imagine without uh, packaging. You can buy um, soap. You can buy hand cream, you can buy oil, you can buy uh, wine, beer, you name it. Honey, uh, cereals, pasta, beer, uh, anything without packaging. And you buy what you need. So it's also reduced the packaging because sometimes you have to buy 200 grams or two kilos and say, I need one kilo. Are you going to throw away the rest or are you going to come back? So these are examples of how to reduce waste. Economic incentives, pay as you throw system. I mean, it is amazing that with the phone, the more I use it, the more I pay normally. With the water, with electricity, the more I use it, the more I pay. But in the city where I live, in Barcelona, um, my waste bill comes with a water uh, invoice. And it doesn't matter if I produce two tons a day or two kilos a day, I pay the same. This doesn't make any sense. The more waste you produce, the more you should pay. And there's examples of this uh, working. Another alternative is, is the opposite. You pay a fee, and the less you waste, the more you save. So that's also it's a positive incentive. Instead of penalizing, you reward for the good behavior. More, residual separation and research center. That goes back to this black bag. Because we want to know what is in there. The current system of waste management is based on you have a problem, you have waste, you don't want it. I make it disappear. I send it away. You know where waste, where away is now, right? What you have to do in the future, if waste is a mistake, you should know what is the mistake if you're going to fix it. Otherwise, you cannot fix a mistake that you don't know what it is. Easy as that. So you have a, a facility. I'm not going to go too much into detail into that, but basically, from the part that cannot be recycled, in theory, there's still some parts with a magnetic and optical and, um, and physical detectors you can, you can select a bit. You can extract more toxics. The non-recyclable fraction, you can send it to a research center. I'm going to that in a second. And there's still the organics there. You can compose them so that they don't have a biological activity, so they don't produce methane, and then you can safely landfill it. Like this, what is left from, the, from waste, is it can be less than 5%. It can be a lot less. It depends, of course, on the commitment of the people. But if you do the right thing, it's very little, and it doesn't pollute much, because it is inert. The non-recycled materials, if you bring together the local university or the technical college to study what is there that cannot be recycled, then the brightest minds in our society, because we have the brightest generation in humankind, let's not forget that, can find a way so that in the future this doesn't appear in the, in the waste bin. So 
we can avoid this waste in the future. So better industrial design is the, the ninth step, very important. Example, this is in Italy. They, they have this research center, so they go and see in the, in the town of Capanori, 50,000 inhabitants, what is left after having separated 80%. Uh, people there managed to separately collect 80% of the waste. This 20%, what is left? They checked, they know what is inside. Diapers or nappies, depends how. Um, that is a problem. We have to see either reusable nappies or, uh, of course, they have to be separately collected so that they don't smell. What they did is they, in the same town, they pushed for an initiative of a local producer who contacted mothers in the, in the town to start suing reusable nappies. So you employ local women, you have reusable nappies so that these nappies don't end up causing troubles in the collection point. And in a way, it's good for the local economy it's, and it's good for, for everyone. Um, another thing, it was Italy, so of course you find lots of coffee. With the new trend of the Nespresso and all that, this is a fantastic example of like, okay, so how do we think things? These coffee capsules are perfectly recyc recyclable. They are either plastic or they are uh, aluminum, both recyclable. And inside you have coffee grounds, with, which are perfect for compost or even if you want to grow mushrooms, it, they, they are very good. The problem is if, if you uh, chuck them away like this, this is a problem because it's difficult to separate, the coffee grounds are going to be contaminated and you are losing the recyclables. So what they did is they sent a nice letter to Lavazza, to Nespresso and said like, look, there is this problem. We have this amount of coffee capsules, which in Italy amounts to this amount. How do, how, what are you going to do about it? Because in the future, this is going to increase. And it's your responsibility. Then it's the concept of extended produce responsibility that I don't have time to go into. But these are examples. If you know what is inside, you can act on it. If you don't see what is inside this black bag, there's nothing you can do because you don't know what is the problem. You say, this is waste. So the message to the industry is clear. If a product can be reused, repaired, recycled, or composted, it should be redesigned or taken out of the system. It can be taken out of the system with taxes, with bans, with, uh, with targets, but that should be the way to follow. Right now, what we find is that if most of these products that cannot be reused, repaired, or recycled, they are cheaper than those who can be uh, reused, repaired, or recycled. So the economic incentives are wrong. It's very difficult we're going to get somewhere. But in some places, this is happening, it's changing. So we need better industrial design for the 21st century. So at the end, the 10th step is a temporary landfill. I mean, if you build an incinerator, you are stuck with a burning capacity for the next 20 or 30 years. So that's not flexible. With the example that I've given you, I mean, there are places that only in one year they have increased from 20% separate collection to more than 80% and who are aiming for zero waste in like 10 years. And, and that is happening. So you, what you need is a temporary landfill where you're putting stabilized materials and that you can continue to reduce. Important, seven of these is community responsibility. This is our work. If we separate this correctly, if we recycle it, and that's the municipalities, then 70 or 80 percent of the problem is solved. The rest, is, there's some part in the society that we, no matter what we do, cannot recycle. And this is industrial responsibility. These are the companies that have to change. And we have to make them change, be it with popular pressure, be it, be it with uh, taxes or something. And there, I mean, I second what, what Rainer was saying, we really need the people, we need the let's do it movement to start pushing also in this direction, because otherwise we cannot go beyond the 70-80% recycling, at least in the, in the global north. So, zero waste, it, it can be low tech, we don't need sophisticated technologies for that. What I explained is mostly quite, quite simple to, to implement. Um, it keeps most of the money spent in the local area, that's important. You, if, if uh, India, for example, buy, buys an incinerator from a Dutch company, what you're doing is exporting your money. If you build a door-to-door -door separate collection with recycling on the site and with composting uh, on site, what you're doing is creating local jobs, reducing emissions, and building sustainability. Because you're going to, if you have compost, you have better soils, you can produce your own food. Um, every component of what I explained is already operating somewhere in the world. 
and there are some cases where we're trying to put them together so that this is working. Um, it is better for, well, that I already said, into this discipline, into the system, um, integrates higher education into solution. And that's very important. Because if we find the perfect technology that is going to do all the work for us, what is the education? If I put a machine at home that is going to, I just throw everything in there, I don't have to take care of anything, what is the message? What, what is the education? I mean, this is like watching, uh, sit down in the sofa, watching TV, everything gets done for you, you don't have to think. That is good in the short term. In the long run, the new generations are going to have a problem. It's positive. It is depressing to watch TV these days. You watch TV, it's the end of the world, it's a Durban is a disaster, they're going to bomb Iran, uh, Europe is in a financial crisis. It is, it, it is really depressing to watch the news these days. We, have, we need political uh, positive messages. And the let's do it message is, I think it's very positive. And the strategy like this is also useful because you're bringing hope with tools. We're going to produce local jobs. We're going to reduce emissions. We're going to recycle at home. You're going to see the, the effects of your activity at home. And that is positive. That's what people need, something that they can understand because we all produce this thing here. Um, it brings people together because in the places where the zero waste alternatives are being implemented, I see people like nowhere else working together. Because if you want to impose this on your politicians, you really need uh, strong public support. If you say, I'm going to contract a waste management company to do the work for me, they're going to come up with a system that is going to be OK. It's going, OK, we're going to burn 50% of the waste. The rest will uh, separate it like this, like that. And we'll see what we can do. The results, not very transparent. And in the end, it, it is a problem. It challenges the creativity of the citizens and decision makers. It's a, the change of paradigm that we're talking about. It's about us being actors and not just uh, the audience of the politicians. And offers more hope about the future because we have a solution, we have a way out. Um, what does it take? It, I more or less said it. It takes you. Basically, it takes you to ask your politicians, it takes you to start sorting at home, it takes you to talk to the neighbors, it takes you to do home composting, to do community composting, um, it takes the people. And we have communities all over the world basically pushing this message. And some places we are more successful and some places we are less successful. But the truth is that this is happening. And in the places where we have zero waste, surprise, we don't have much litter. So uh, I'm afraid the let's do it campaign there would not work because there's no waste, or there's not much waste. Um, in Europe, there is a network the, that is growing, but as I tell you, I mean, around the world, we have many examples, just two examples, one of the north, one of the south. In San Francisco, San Francisco, that's where they invented this plant obsolescence thing. Huh? Um, it generates lots of waste still, but um, in the 90s, they were discussing, okay, what are we going to do? Are we going to build an incinerator and uh, try to separate what we can, etc., follow the American model, or are we going to be visionary and do a change? The opposition of the people, and really like people pushing the mayor to do something different, uh, pushed them to approve a zero waste strategy for 2020. It was very far away then. So, so okay. And they went for it. They, they banned the incinerator for some years, but they started with very aggressive separate collection, door-to-door, -door, uh, composting very close, um, etc. And they jumped to 2003, 30%, 2010, 75%. They go for 100% to 2020. Right now, um, most of the waste is being separately collected and composted or recycled, etc. I can explain a lot of details about this, but I, I don't have the time. But what they're working now is in industrial responsibility. It's like, how do you convince industry that what you put in the market can be recycled or composted and can be treated in an easy way? And they have very good examples. Another example, in India, precisely, in the state of Kerala, in South India, there is the, the town of, of Kovalam. That also had kind of the same problem. Um, it's a touristy city, and what they see, what they saw, is that the, the beaches were starting to get dirtier and dirtier. The tourists started to complain to the hotel owners, like, we don't want to come here, this is dirty. So the hotel owners talked to the mayor, so like, what can we do? And the mayor asked advice, said, like, we'll build an incinerator. Then the community side reacted, it's like, okay, what do you mean, let's build an incinerator here that we don't know how this operates, etc. 
let's try to do something. And the community took the initiative of changing the system. And they took it and changed it upside down. They started separately collect co collecting uh, waste. Um, they compost a lot more. They even have these biogas digesters where you put your organics and you create methane with which you can create electricity and you can have uh, gas at home. Um, they have a lot more reuse. They have libraries with second-hand books. Um, they have recyclers. Um, they generate lots of jobs, especially for women, when it comes to, like, for example, uh, sewing the, um, the cloth discards, for example, because the composition of waste there is, is, is very different. Um, also, they have a lot of locally grown organic food, thanks to the compost they're producing, which is something that the tourists really love. So what the result of all this change was that it increased tourism. And how did this happen? It's thanks to the community engaging with the hotels that were the first ones interested in cleaning the tank. And that happened also in the global south. So this is something that is possible, and it's happening. Maybe you've seen that. <laughs> this was, this was the, the slogan of the 60s, 70s. There was a generation where you had the Vietnam War, when you had the oil crisis. Um, well, the message is quite clear. Wars were the problem at that time. Now, since we are the brightest generation of humankind, also the one who is producing more waste, but it doesn't matter. If we analyze what is the problem, what is causing the wars these days, is precisely the war for resources. Resources starting from oil and going also to biomass. In Europe, we're exporting one third of the biomass that we consume here. That means food, that means wood, that means lots of things. And the rest of the world is the same. So if you, we cannot run a, a linear economy on a finite planet. And that, I think, it's an evidence. The wars in the future are going to come because of resources. If you have zero waste, you are increasing the sustainability. That's why in the US, also in California, where this uh, make love of not war started, the hippies already 10 years ago started saying, make love, not waste. And they think, may this be the the new waste, the, the new peace movement of the 21st century. Because, the, after all, if we want to avoid wars in our world, if we want to turn the United Nations into something that is uh, where people are going to meet to really solve the common problems, we have to solve the issue of resources. And if we generate waste, what we're doing is we increase our dependency of uh, imports. That means that we're going to try to get imports at a cheap price from no from either nowhere. And we see the price of oil, the price of uh, commodities going up a lot lately. So we really have uh, to build on that. I just wanted to finish saying that I think that the virus that you have here is also the virus that we have in the zero waste movement. And I think that uh, at the end of the day, we are the same. We want to live in a world without waste. We want to clean it. We want to recycle it. We want to design a better economy. I thank you very much. Thank you, Sean Mark. One or two questions or comments, if there are. Huh? Yeah. Jean Mark, I was thinking. Um, what if we could uh, figure out some way to, um, to do it like this, that when we do a country cleanup, we could have a participant signing for some kind of a, would that be like an earth contract or something like this, where they would uh, you know, support those measures. And by, by using them you know, as a tool, as a mess together, so we could, you know, they would do just one more thing instead of just cleaning, but they would you know, support this, those, uh, those slogans. So if you could, uh, you could help with this, different countries, just to make sure that they would sharpen the message for the region. Perhaps we could get to the uh, zero waste clean planet quicker. Huh? No, absolutely. I mean, in fact, 
I wanted to propose that, but I forgot. So thank you very much, Rainer. I think that it is very important to say that the let's do it is not about changing the waste from A to B. It's about making waste disappear somehow, but fa phasing it out. So it's important that to say, we, the communities, are going to clean now, but next time we don't want to see this here. So this is the way how we're going to avoid having to clean this up again for you. So I, I think it makes absolute sense. So it really gives uh, like, a, a, like a continuity to the project. And, and those, you, something that you have that the Zero Waste Movement doesn't have is access to people. Because your message, it touches the people. Because you have involved, you have a list of contacts that is huge. If you manage to engage all these people into these kind of messages, the strength is amazing. So I, I, really, I really second this, this proposal. I think it will be fantastic. Reiner, I'd just like to continue upon your thought because something struck me just now, actually. Uh, I don't know what's the binding number in each country for a referendum, you know, which, which then binds the country to do it. So we had already three million people. So we could just make a referendum global for all the countries of the world that would be bring, brought to all the governments of the world that we don't want waste anymore. And uh, I think maybe it could work, you know. <laughs> Yeah, then, then it would take less than 10 years, sure. 